doesn't need me to say you are in for a really, really interesting evening today. We have got some of our top um, uh, experts in the field of both peripheral nerves and brachial plexus, and they're going to be sharing their experience and their thoughts and um, their views on nerve stuff, and uh, it is going to be quite a treat of an evening. Just before we move on, as is always the case, we've got some housekeeping points. Um, you are going to be seeing some really interesting cases today, um, but we do ask you to, to respect our patient privacy. Um, as far as is possible, these images have been anonymized, but please, they're not for uh, being shared to the public platforms. We're going to be doing a, a few questions and answers at the end of each talk, and then there will be time for much uh, more talk at the end of all of the three talks. Um, but if you can put your questions down in the Q&A, you're all now probably very well versed with how to do this. And I'll try and do my very best to uh, get to as many as I can, but obviously can't promise that they're going to all get answered. And the other interesting thing you're going to have is a bit of a geek out at the end of each talk. So 90 seconds for each of the um, speakers to be able to give you something really super specialist. So without further ado, we're going to go on to introducing our first speaker for this evening. And that is Mr. Tom Quick. So Tom, following on from his fellowship at the Royal National Orthopaedic uh, uh, Hospital, uh, the PNI unit, he was appointed there as a consultant in March 2013. Can't quite believe it was that long ago now, Tom. Um, he, his main interests are in obstetric brachial plexus palsy. Um, he also deals obviously with all the traumatic nerve injuries and that obviously very much includes all of the brachial plexus work. Uh, but he also has a, a, a significant interest in the peripheral nerve uh, treatment of spasticity, as well as nerve injury and the development of the growing shoulder. He's probably got one of the largest obstetric, practice, obstetric palsy practices in the UK, and he has uh, work both at Great Ormond Street, as well as the Evelina Children's Hospital. He's got an incredible amount of, of experience in supra and infraclavicular uh, plexus injuries. I'd also like to mention he does like to put his uh, theory into practice, uh, testing the effect of cold water on his uh, peripheral sensory nerves whilst he's doing his open water swimming. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Tom. Well, thank you for that intro, Kate. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, as I go through the takeaway that I've done, um, I have uh, feedback at the end. Uh, with me with uh, severe hypothermia, gibbering like an idiot. So if you do want some entertainment, I'll cover it again at the end of this talk because I'm not entirely sure I covered any of the points I intended to um, due to the coldness of my brain. Um, my name's Tom Quick. Um, as Kate very kindly uh, introduced, I do Just Nerve um, uh, at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital and uh, Research Interest at uh, UCL. Um, website at nerveinjury.co.uk and please follow me on Twitter. There'll be some content following from here as well, I'm sure. Uh, if it's not just us singing sea shanties, you may have seen that. Uh, it's going to be a whistle at top store, so you're holding on to your hats as we go. It's going to be fast and uh, hopefully interesting and informative. And I will have 90 seconds to uh, tell you a little bit about something that uh, gets me just, um, inappropriately overexcited. Um, my practice, as I said, is paediatric adult nerve injury um, all over the body. Um, and I have a research interest as well with UCL and we formed the Centre of Nerve Injury, uh, Nerve Engineering there. Um, and that website's very useful for you as well for research things. So we're going to talk, what is a nerve injury? Uh, this is what most of you think about uh, nerves. This is my bowl of udon noodle. And yes, the plexus does look a bit like that. But nerve is a highly functional concentrated structure. It's made up of nerve cells. We call the nerve the same as the nerve cells, but it's not just nerve cells in there. There's blood cells, uh, sorry, blood vessels, uh, connective tissue and supportive cells, the Schwann cell, which is uh, the, the uh, supportive cell of the axon within the nerve. And nerves control everything that you do. Every touch, feeling, movement, all communicated from your CNS to your PNS, central nervous system, to your peripheral nervous system. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is a neuron, the cell body there on the left, uh, that you can see my arrow, and then the axon, this is the working unit here that transmits with the action potential uh, and in a myelinated nerve, saltatory conduction along backwards and forwards. Um, and they control all of your functions, all of your bodily functions come through nerves. And the central nervous system in the middle there encased in a bony box, never to be touched, 
uh, and we deal with things outside of the dura. So all those other little bits of udon. Um, and because they can affect any part of the body, it can have an effect on your arms, your legs, your chest, your abdomen, pelvis, um, and it creates a, a lack of muscle function. And I'll talk about that in my geek out um, and uh, numbness, dry skin, pain, stiff joints. So it's motor touch, sympathetics and pain. And that's all that the nerves do. And to remember all those functions of nerves, because quite a lot of you co commonly would just say, well, there's a wrist drop, but not tell me that much about exactly what's going on with anything else. So we need to recognize that that's motor touch, sympathetics and pain. I'll give you a little way to remember that in three, four slides time. So they're delicate. They don't like being stretched. They don't like being squashed or cut. And these mechanisms are exactly the mechanisms that you see in trauma, like the twist of an ankle fracture or the bend of a femoral fracture or the impaction of a, um, uh, uh, an acetabular or pelvic fracture. It's exactly the same. Many of you will know about Seddon and Sunderland's classifications. That's really important for you to know for the exam, but practically you need to go through every axon and classify them for that to make much sense. So a more general classification is to think about something as either a neuroapraxia, easily more easily um, said is conduction block, and that says what it is, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, or a degenerative injury. A degenerative injury, imagine you're out in the garden, you cut a worm in two. You do not get two worms, that's not how baby worms are formed. You get one half a worm and a dead half a worm. And the same thing happens with an axon. So the cell body, the bit that can create the protein, the head and our little worm here stays alive, and the bit connected to that lives because it still has protein synthesis in the cell body. The distal bit dies away. A guy called Waller told us about that, so we call it Wallerian degeneration. So that axon dies away and the worm tries to regrow a tail. The same thing happens with your nerves. Here it is with the axon, it's cut, the distal bit degenerates, the muscle, for example, becomes denervated. In the bottom left in C, we see the worm starting to regrow its tail, and finally it becomes a fully functioning worm again. Here's a nerve laceration. All the little bits that look like sperm are actually nerves, axons with growth cones on. And you can see that quite a few have managed this. This is a proximal bit here and they're growing across. You can see some have made their ways down into the, into the distal segment, all these Schwann cells and basement membrane here to support them. All these ones have got a bit lost and these have got really confused. And that's the growth cone acted in myosin, just like a little uh, amoeba smelling out where it wants to go. So that's degenerative nerve injury. Now that can be favorable or non-favorable. If those nerves, if that little green amoeba can find somewhere to grow, it will do. So in a crush injury here at the bottom, both of these injuries created at the same time, you can see all those axons have grown through. They've all got a basement membrane and Schwann cells and they just grow through. But if you cut the nerve, the axons have got nowhere to go. Those little growth cones just get lost, they form a neuroma. So that's a degenerative injury on both of these. All the axons died and regrew. But on the top, it's an unfavorable prognosis and neuroma is formed. Leave that for six weeks, 12 weeks. It's not going to get better. The crush injury will. And the way we can tell the difference is these growth cones, when you tap on them, have a Tonell sign. So Jules Tonell described after trauma, and that's important, after trauma, there is a, a, a tingling sign when you tap along the nerve felt in the distal territory of that nerve. And if that Tonell sign, the point where there's growth cones, you can find them by tapping, if that moves along, advances a millimeter a day, an inch a month, then that's going to get better all by itself. There's a favorable prognosis. You have to do nothing, just predict the future and see it come true. But if the axon stays still, we need to go in and give that nerve somewhere to grow to. The opposite of this injury is called a neuroapraxia. Neuro meaning nerve, apraxia meaning not working, apraxic, not working. It's easier to call it conduction block. This nerve is anatomically intact but physiologically broken. So it's there, but it's not working. It hasn't died away, so there's no Tinel sign. It's just like a fuse of a bomb. Imagine the bomb's the muscle, the fuse is the nerve. If the fuse gets wet, it's anatomically intact, it's still there, but it's physiologically broken. It won't transmit that conduction to make the bomb go off, the muscle contract. One other thing to recognize is around the uh, environment of the nerve is also as important as what's going on with the nerve itself. And this is a cicatrix. This is what happens to trees when they get damaged. The same thing happens to nerve. You get contractile scar. And contractile scar compresses nerve, can create pain, can create conduct persistent conduction block. 
And that, again, is a very important appreciation. It's not just what's in the nerve, it's what's around the nerve. So we go back, all these functions of nerve, motor, touch, sympathetics, and pain, might try something professional, MTSP. So remember, every time you see a nerve, you need to think about the mechanism, has it been stretched, cut, bruised, lacerated? In the same way as trauma, you know, was that a train traveling at 100 miles an hour or were they just hit with a tennis ball? Those differences in mechanism are really key in trauma, in nerves, just as it is in bones. And then we assess all functions of nerve because that tells us about exactly what's going on. There might be a motor drop with those big, heavy fibers being damaged. But if you can say the sympathetics there and some light touch, then you know the nerves in continuity, at least to some extent. Muscle function. We're going to come back to this later as I geek out. But how do we assess muscle function? I'll come back to this later. Sensation. We need to recognize when we're assessing nerves that it's quite complicated, the branching of that nerve. You all, I'm sure, know your brachial plexus anatomy, and it mixes up root levels. And the areas that get numb relate not just to the root levels, if the injury is not here in the neck, if the injury is further down, there'll be different patterns. And understanding this pattern of nerve injury as opposed to this pattern of root injury is very important in assessment. So please don't tell me there's a C6 injury if it's an infraclavicular injury. So there's a C6 dermatomal pattern if it's an infraclavicular injury, because it won't be. It will be an affectation of the lateral cutaneous nerve or the superficial radial nerve or the fiber, C6 fibers to the median. So think about that. Sympathetic, sweating, hair loss, rugosity of skin. I'm sure you all know this trick but if you have a laceration of a digital nerve, if you put a wet dressing around a finger, really useful in kids and come back, you'll see that the side that has a digital nerve uh, gets crinkly when it gets wet. That sort of pruning of the skin that you see when you've been in the bath for too long. And if there's no nerve there, there won't be that same sign. Pain, neuropathic pain is really important. You all recognize those descriptors, lancinating, shooting, burning, squeezing. It is very difficult to treat, but there are a number of surgical diagnoses that are surgically amenable. So please, please don't go, and I think um, uh, talks later, we're gonna talk on, on this, but please, please don't just go straight to the diagnosis of exclusion, which is CRPS. If there are diagnoses that you can make, it is not CRPS. Neurostonalgia, uh, symptomatic post-traumatic neuroma, causalgia, post-traumatic neuritis, all improvable, maybe not curable, but improvable with surgery. Nerve injury is complicated, is best treated in appreciation of the whole condition in an MDT setting. And because of that, this really is not something where you just do surgery, repair a nerve and never see your patient again. It's as important what you do after your surgery, well, assessment and surgery as it is what you do. It's, in, it's decisions and then follow up rather than incisions. So just to remind you, mechanism, how is it injured? MTSP, looking at motor touch, sympathetics and pain, looking for a tunnel, neurophysiology and imaging. They're useful, but probably not like you would expect. They're not going to give you an answer if you haven't done all of that first. My final point, the importance of a diagnosis. Nerve injury is not a diagnosis. Nobody would think sore knee is a diagnosis. Nerve injury is the same. It's, it's an area of the body or a mechanistic system with dysfunction. We need to go beyond nerve injury to get a diagnosis. Is it a degenerative nerve injury? Is it a favorable prognosis, a, a non-favorable prognosis? Is it a majority conduction block? These are important things to know about the mechanism of the injury and the likely nature of the nerve injury, but also the anatomic location. So what areas of the nervous system are involved? So people will often say, never at all, I've never heard any orthopod say this is just an injured shoulder it'll be a label you know a slap lesion or whatever else so no one ever says this is a classic case of injured shoulder it will almost certainly get better all by itself but how many times have you heard this is a classic case of nerve injury almost certainly get better all by itself if you've examined all those functions of nerve and you understand the mechanism and you know the diagnosis then you can talk about natural history but unless you've got a diagnosis you cannot give a natural history and you can't therefore say if intervention is going to improve upon that or indeed what the condition or prognosis is likely to be. I'm very briefly going to talk, touch on my quick case, the ortho hub case that I put up. As I said, I was a gibbering, chattering idiot on my uh, video. So just to make it clear, uh, supracondylar fracture, 
that presents like this in the morning meeting. Obviously, this is a far from ideal situation, but in the morning, it's been made a mess of. And the reason I picked this case is because we are now, we don't have the problem of thinking that we don't want to take it to theatre. Everybody wants to take this back to theatre. But what do you do if you have neurologic or neurovascular involvement as well at the same time? And I think that's for general discussion. I have very strong feelings on this because I recognize the antromedial entrapment. So the artery and the median nerve, the brachial artery and the median nerve run across that antromedial aspect of the anticubital fossa. And our guidelines are very clear. If you've not read the boast and the blue book, please do that excellent guidelines for your care. But with this kind of stretching and the periosteal tearing and that sharp piece of bone, it's very easy that this can all get entrapped entrapped within the fracture. And you often see, so here on the right hand side, here's proximal, here's distal, here's our fracture line, and just a nerve that's just tethered, just held in tight. And it's relatively straightforward. It can often look like it's periosteum. So doing an S-shaped incision across the front of the elbow, knowing the anatomy, be aware that the artery and that nerve are just going to be pulled tight. They're going to look like periosteum. But if they, are, if they are involved and the fracture is malreduced, there is probably a reason for that. It's been difficult, probably because all this is caught in the fracture site. So there's that bony spike. Um, and if you take it out, here's that bony spike. You can just see that's been dragged in by that periosteum and that fascia. And this in time will improve. There's no neuroma here. There's a, a bit of a post um, uh, stenotic swelling, but this nerve did just fine. Sometimes, and that was the end of the case after we released that and everything had improved. Sometimes it's actually in the bone. So this was a bit later, another case entirely, but the nerve goes into the bone, it's all healed up, comes out again here. The only thing we're then able to do, if you leave this till 10, 12 weeks afterwards, is excise the bit that's in the bone and put some nerve grafts in. So that's a very much more significantly challenging um, case. Often with these as well, we can flex up the elbow and uh, undertake a primary repair, but in this child that really gave me no space in which to uh, do that suture. So we put some grafts in and that all went rather well. Mechanism, might try something professional. Tonell, and really please remember that diagnosis. Brilliant, thank you very much, Tom. That was, that was excellent. Um, you've actually already, uh, come to a couple of the questions that have already been asked. But one thing, one question that has come up, which I think is quite interesting, and it would be also good to know from the rest of the panel. So the role of imaging in nerve injuries. So a, a good example being a brachial plexus traction injury and um, someone's arranged for an MRI of the plexus and it's come back as normal, but clearly you've got signs that there is a, a plexal injury. So the question being, what is the role for imaging in these kind of injuries? So um, I might actually ask uh, Chris as a starter, what, what, what's your feeling on this, Chris? I agree with Tom entirely. Imaging will not supplant the examination. The vast majority of what we, um, how we decide things as peripheral nerve surgeons is based on the physical examination, perhaps electrodiagnostics. Imaging, I don't think has quite caught up uh, yet. That being said, I mean, I had a case exactly like perhaps the one that was described in which there was a sharp, what ended up being a sharp laceration of the upper trunk and the MRI of the brachial plexus that the patient came in with was originally interpreted as normal. That being said, an MRI is only as good as the person interpreting it. And I did collaborate with one of our neuroradiology colleagues who I work with all the time and asked him to look at it. And he said, no, this is clearly a laceration of the upper trunk. And lo and behold, it was a lacerated upper trunk. So, you know, you can't rely entirely on, um, on imaging. It is one piece of the puzzle. It helps if it triangulates well with the rest of the data that you've gathered, fantastic. But don't hang your hat on it. I don't know if that's a saying in the UK, hang your hat on something, but you know, we say that here in America. It's a great saying, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with that. Um, so, so then actually the, the the next thing I was, going to, I was going to ask is, is there ever a role in, in getting an MRI scan? Is there ever something that, that anybody feels is, is useful? Um, see why, do you, do you ever get imaging? Oh yeah, well, I, I work very closely with my radiologist. The way I use imaging is to support my diagnosis or to refute my diagnosis. So before I order the test, I've more or less made up my mind about what I'm gonna do with that injury. 
So I use imaging to in, sometimes to support my diagnosis or to look for evidence to prove me otherwise. Mm. However, I think we'll keep on coming back to this where clinical assessment is always the key. Mm. Uh, having said that, I'm aware of some very exciting development in MR neurography such as imaging the roots. So there will be really advanced detail, but that is still not in mainstream use. It's still in developmental experimental stage. Yeah, I do, I do think, you know, particularly with the, with the plexal injuries, you know, certainly getting an MRI of the C-spine to see whether or not you've got any evidence of a, a root avulsion, how, there is a role for that. Um, but, um, but no, that's, that's very interesting. One other quick question I've got, um, back to you, Tom. Um, so you talked about MTSP. Um, sensation in particular, we all, um, I'm going to say, go back to what Chris said, hang our hat on the whole two point discrimination. Um, but actually my question to you is, is that actually a useful thing? Because I actually think probably the return of protective sensation is what's really important. Um, and so I'm just interested to know what your, your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so um, Josh Harold, who's a, um, an academic uh, occupational therapist has essentially thrown out the fact that uh, two point uh, discrimination is much use moving two points much much better but still to me it's presence or absence of sensation but more than that it's the quality so it's a subjective experience so describe that to me is it 10 out of 10 is it 5 out of 10 does it feel fluffy is it strange is it tingly is it painful and light touch pain so the misinterpretation of light touch sensation as pain which is which is allodynia is a sign that there is still an ongoing nerve in, in injury. Very commonly, nerves that are still squashed, compressed, stretched, create this allodynia. And so it's a really important sign to say, A, the nerve is in continuity, because you're touching the skin and the brain is getting that message, but that misinterpretation is a really important sign. So light touch pain, or even deep touch pain, muscular pain on, 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 on palpation, really important to you the nerves in continuity, but that quality is really important. Right. Um, I think we'll we'll move on at this point. So um, so now it gives me great well, pleasure. To... Do you not want me to geek out? We are we gonna do that? Didn't we just? You want to do another geek out? No, no, I'm happy. I thought I was gonna. That's no, fine. That's fine. Oh, no, no. Well, if we do that now, we can. Yeah, we can do that now. Let's well, do that I now. Did it in sixty seconds rather than ninety. Yeah, do, no, do do that now. Okay, perfect. So, um, are you are you timing me? Am I timing myself? I'll time you. I'm going to start. I've got 60 okay. seconds. I'm going. So I want to talk no. to you about muscle assessments because this is what I did my thesis on. It's what excites me. If I ask you as an orthopod to examine a muscle, you're going to tell me peak force. You're going to tell me how strong that muscle is. Now that is great, but it's not everything. So the MRC grading is pretty much utterly pointless. It is not linked with patient satisfaction. In my thesis, I looked at a group of uh, patients who had, had uh, muscle reinnovation for elbow flexion via nerve transfer, and we looked at their force. It was normally distributed, which was wonderful, but what we then found out was that wasn't linked with patient satisfaction. What is, is the subjective lived experience of reinnovated motor function. Is it painful? Is it owned? Is it graduated? Can it sustain contraction? Does it work with the other muscles or does it co-contract? So patients tell us that that is important, that is linked with outcome, peak force is not, and I have four seconds left and I'm done. You should go on just a minute, that was good. <laughs> that was repetition, <laughs> um, I'm sure. <laughs> no, that was good, there was no repetition, well done. Um,